Welcome to Dementia Friendly Prince George's County, Maryland, Northern Sector webinar series for caregivers. Today's topic is making a resolution to take care of yourself by Jen C. Haynes, sponsored by Prince George's County Government and the Department of Family Services. Hello, welcome to today's webinar. It is make a resolution to take care of yourself. Kick off 2024 with a plan to make yourself a priority. Here's me. This is my husband, Steve. This is me and this is our son. And this is where you can reach me um, through email and I will also have that at the end. But so I am a family caregiver. I was a caregiver for my dad, but I've been a caregiver for my husband, Steve, who was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment when he was 55 years old in December of 2009. Our son, that young man in the picture, at that time was in junior high school. He is now the reason I am an Air Force mom. Um, I am the co-author on the four books in the 365 Caregiving Tips series, and I am the creator and editor of the Before the Diagnosis Stories of Life and Love books. I volunteer in the community. I am a teacher as a volunteer at our senior center where I teach a class I created called Games for Brains, and I've been doing that for 13 years. And I have been a senior citizens commissioner in our city since July of 2017. So that's a little bit about me. Now, if you're a caregiver, you're taking care of yourself while you're doing everything you normally did. In addition to taking on everything you need to do to take care of someone else, plus you're taking over whatever they did. And you're supposed to find time to take care of yourself. All of this just sounds absolutely overwhelming. How are you supposed to do this? That's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to start by talking about guilt. Most people feel guilty about things at some point. As caregivers, we have so many more things to feel guilty about. Now, I'm gonna give you examples of things I've done. You know, you were short with your loved one. You forgot to do something. Oh my stars, frankly, the list is much too long and I didn't wanna list it all. I can't absolve your guilt, but I can tell you that you have no reason to feel guilty about taking care of yourself. Don't worry about the things that people tell you that you should be doing. Ignore those articles and lists of how to decorate your house, what the what color you should norm not you know what color you should paint your house, what color you shouldn't use in your house anymore. The hottest books, music and movies. Personally, my least favorite lists are the lists that start right after Thanksgiving and seem to come out daily through Christmas Eve, telling us how to wrap our gifts, what to bake and how to decorate. How in the world am I supposed to do all those things when I haven't done it before and it's leading up to Christmas? So you are absolved of guilt. So today we are going to talk about resolutions and goals, what self-care is and isn't, and suggestions for how to incorporate self-care into your life. And I'm hoping that you'll be able to leave here today with action plan. But this is a great time to grab paper and a pen or some other note-taking system so you can write down what strikes your fancy. And as I said, you will leave here with an expanded idea of self-care beyond the, the things that we always hear about. Goals that you can set and a plan for how to accomplish those goals. Because if we only have the goals and we don't have a plan, it doesn't always work. So let's get started. Resolutions. A resolution is a decision to do or not to do something. Oh, and let's make that a firm decision to do or not to do something. Over 60% of people feel pressured to set resolutions. Yikes, that's a lot to feel pressured. Personally, I don't set resolutions. Maybe it's just semantics, but I set goals for the year. I meet some. I don't meet others and I adjust them along the way. We tend to view January 1st as the time for resolutions. We hear about the big resolutions, lose weight, stop smoking and stop drinking. And to set a resolution, you focus on a goal, split it into smaller goals, decide on the actions you'll need to take and set a schedule. It sure gets complicated, doesn't it? But it does involve focusing on a goal, which in today's case is self-care. So we're, let's, talk for a moment about goal setting. Goals help you move from the idea, in this case of taking care of yourself, to actually doing it. Let's be frank, we've all had that idea to say, yeah, I need to take care of myself. 
this is going to help you to actually do it. Now, one important thing about setting goals is that you need to visit them throughout the year. If you set them on January 1st and you don't look at them again until December 31st, chances are you'll forget about them. Or at least that's what happened in my case. I now set a reminder in my phone that pops up every two months to say, look at your goals. Because honestly, one year I didn't do that. And I got to December and I was like, oh, yeah, I wanted to do that in June. And I, I wanted to do that earlier. And, oh, I yeah, And these things just didn't get done. So goals need to be smart, meaning specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. So today we're gonna to go over a bunch of ideas you might wanna to try to take care of yourself. And to demonstrate goal setting and show you it isn't as complicated as this SMART system might make it sound, I'm going to use one of my self-care goals for 2024. I love to walk on the beach. I guess I should let you know I'm in Orange County, California. So I love to walk on the beach. And when I go there, I mean, really, maybe it's 20 to 30 minutes away, depending on traffic tops. It refreshes me. So going to the beach is one way I can take care of myself. And, and yet last year until December 30th, I didn't go to the beach at all in 2023. There's no good reason except that I did not make it a priority. It wasn't a goal, by the way. I'd think about how much I love walking on the beach, but I just did not make the effort to go. At the end of the year, we were having huge waves up to 20 feet and I wanted to go see them. I asked my husband to join me and off we went. It was great. The weather was beautiful and I had a wonderful time. While we were there, I came up with one of my 2024 goals. I decided one of my goals for 2024 is going to be to go to the beach once a month. That is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. But what if I don't meet my goal one month? Do I give up? Do I belittle myself? Or do I just realize life happens and I'll get to the beach as soon as I can? Maybe I even realize my goal actually isn't realistic and revise it. Yes, I can revise my goals to something more manageable, like to go to the beach twice in 2024. I'm sure I could totally do that. And if not, oh, my stars. We operate as if our body's check engine light is on, but we choose to ignore it. Do we ignore the check engine light when it comes on in our car or do we take or do we like swear under our breath, but take the car to get looked at. If we ignore the light, what happens to the car? We don't have warning lights for our bodies. We say we don't have something that lights up, but the truth is we know when we aren't taking care of ourselves and we know when we're getting a sign, we need to take a break or we need to have something in our body looked at and checked. We need to stop ignoring those signs. I wanna congratulate you because being here is an excellent way to take care of yourself. You're doing something for yourself. You're learning ways that you can take care of yourself. And if you choose to, by the end of the session, you will have one or more 2024 goals that will help you accomplish that. I think that sounds pretty cool. People often say, take care of yourself. But what does that mean? I'm going to be honest with you. When I first became a caregiver, I would hear it all the time. Take care of yourself. Oh, take care of yourself. I began to feel like it was that sort of throwaway phrase people use. And I think, well, what do they mean? Am I supposed to go to the spa? Am I supposed to go on a trip? What is it and why is it important? Well, here are some reasons why we might not take care of ourselves. As we discussed, we feel guilty about doing anything for ourselves or having someone else help us. We feel selfish putting our needs first, but if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anyone else. We think no one can do it can do our job as well as we can, which is taking care of our loved ones. We think it's our loved one, so it's our job. But are you sure nobody else could do that job? Maybe they're going to do it a little differently, but they might do it just as well as you do. And they might have some new ideas you can learn from. It's your job to make sure the person is taken care of. But that doesn't mean you need to do it all yourself. We also have trouble asking for what we need, and sometimes we feel inadequate if we need help. And some of the times we do have trouble asking for what we need, we don't really know. My suggestion is every time you think of something you need, no matter how big or how small, just write it down. So that when you need help and someone says, actually says, how can I help you? You have a list you can refer to. And by the way, you're not inadequate. You're human if you need help. We all need it at one time or another. Maybe we don't all admit it, 
We all need help. So caregiver stress can lead to burnout, which is a condition marked by irritability, fatigue, problems with sleep, unwanted weight gain or social loss, feelings of helplessness or hopelessness, and social isolation. And I think it also has come sometimes marked by breaking into tears when someone looks at you cockeyed. So you may have experienced some of these yourselves. I know I have. And you don't always realize it. And I had somebody look at me one time and say, wow, you're really burnt out. And I was like, I am? You know, we need, but we, we know we're not doing well when we break into tears at the pharmacy counter picking up a prescription. So what happens when you don't take care of yourself? Well, we suffer from sleep deprivation. <laughs> we have poor eating habits and poor food choices like just because it's orange, Cheetos are not a carrot. It's still a Cheeto. We don't exercise. We don't take care of ourselves when we're ill. We suffer from emotional and mental health problems. And we suffer from social isolation, which by the way, being reclusive and isolated is now one more thing that is just as bad for us as smoking. Seriously? So now when we're isolated, we should have taken up smoking when we were a teen instead. It's pretty much, it's that bad. So I'm gonna tell you for a second about a friend of mine. She's actually one of the 365 Caregiving Tips co-authors. Um, she is a caregiver for her husband who was hit by a drunk driver and suffers chronic pain. She is caregiver for her brother who has intractable epilepsy and at the time he was living with her and her husband. She would help her husband take care of his mother who I believe had COPD and heart problems. She is the mother of a grown woman but we all know what it's like if you're a mom, you're always vested in that. Oh yeah, and she worked full time. She didn't take care of herself and in her 50s, she had a stroke. She did recover from it, but she really uses that as a lesson to people, caregivers in particular, that you absolutely have to take care of yourself and you have to take those breaks. Because self-care is not optional, it is mandatory. And I'm sure there are some of you right now going, how am I supposed to do this? I'm not sleeping, my loved one is up all night. We're gonna try to find some little ways that you can at least put it into your life. It doesn't have to be a giant thing that is one more thing on your to-do list, so hang in there. Why is self-care important? Dear God, 30% of caregivers die first. We're dead, we're really not taking care of our loved ones, so we have to take care of ourselves, folks. Now, this is a big range, but even at the 40% level, with 40 to 70% of caregivers suffering from depression, even 40% is a huge number. Our overall health suffers when we don't take care of ourselves. Not only if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of somebody else, but if you don't take care of yourself, who will? And nearly 60% of Alzheimer's and dementia caregivers rate the emotional stress of caregiving as high or very high. That's probably not news to some of you. So what does self-care do for you? It reduces anxiety and depression, even doing small things. It reduces your stress and improves your resilience. It improves your happiness, increases your energy, and reduces burnout. These are all really good and important things. Most people, I would say everyone, but we're gonna not be too broad, and we're gonna say most people want a long, healthy lifespan. We want a healthy one, not just a long lifespan. We want to be healthy. And according to the World Health Organization, self-care can help promote health, uh, prevent disease, and help people better cope with illness. Self-care is necessary for everyone, but especially caregivers. However, if we're over a certain age, it's a skill we did not learn about in school or college or scouts or another, another organization. It is a more current, I'd say the last 15 to 20 years thing that we hear about. And that's why for some of us, it's like, what the heck is even self-care? So, the best self-care idea is something you will enjoy and do. I can suggest all sorts of things to you, but if you don't like them, it won't be any good for you. Try things you like. It's kind of like with exercise. The best exercise is the one you're going to do. And if somebody comes to you and says, oh my gosh, running a marathon is fantastic. And the only time in your life you want to be running is if you're being chased by a bear, don't try running a marathon. Pick something else. There's lots of alternatives. Same with this. So what the heck is self-care? Well, 
These are the things we usually hear about when it comes to self-care. I'm pretty sure all of us have heard about them. We need to eat right. We need to get eight hours of sleep. I don't know the last time I did that. We need to exercise. We need to connect with others. We need to meditate. We need to go to the doctor, the dentist, the eye doctor, and of course, reduce stress. And I would say that probably all of those things, except the medical appointments, we're supposed to be doing on a daily basis on top of everything else. And nobody tells us how to do these things. Self-care is taking care of ourselves so we can do the things we want and need to do. It is not selfish or self-indulgent. We take care of ourselves by eating healthy food with a minimal amount of junk food or candy. Believe me, I'm not telling you 100% of what you put in your body has to be perfect, but we do want to minimize the junk and the candy. We need to drink water. In my case, I need to drink more water than coffee because I think sometimes my body is more coffee than water. We need to get exercise. We need to sleep. It's kind of like the Goldilocks syndrome, not too much, not too little, but just right. Connect with others and get professional help, both physical and mental. How do we do them? We're going to talk about it. But very important. This is extremely important. There is no shame in talking to a professional to help you with your mental health. You don't have to tell people you're talking to someone or share it on social media. It's nobody's business but your own. And your mental health is just as important as your physical health. And believe me, if you can talk to somebody who can help you see that you're doing wonderful things and but you need to take care of yourself and help you reduce your stress, it is going to We need to accept imperfections and give ourselves grace. Not everything worth doing has to be done perfectly. Believe me, it doesn't. Let things slide. The housework and the yard work will wait. People aren't coming over to see your yard or house. They're coming over to see you. Keep a few frozen meals on hand for those days you can't bear to cook. Oh, I know I have them. I'm guessing most people do. And it's so nice to be able to open it and go, oh, look at Stouffer's. Yes, we're having frozen lasagna or we happen to have a frozen pizza. And this is a form of self-care because you're not expecting yourself to be perfect. It's next to impossible, if not downright impossible, to be perfect. Simplify your life where possible. Look, order pizza for dinner. Maybe even have that pizza for dinner or delivered. I'm not saying doing it every day, but I'll tell you, last summer, oh, my husband was really sick. My husband, who has the mild cognitive impairment, and we didn't know what was wrong. And while we'll get to this part later, my mind is immediately jumping to this is, oh my gosh, this is how it's going to be from now on. He like isn't functioning. He couldn't pick up a brick, a regular sized brick in the backyard. What the heck was wrong with him? And I was just, just not dealing well with this at all. And I thought, I want a pizza for dinner. And you're going to laugh, but because I am 63. And so for the first time in my life, I ordered myself a pizza that I had delivered to my house. I was so proud of myself for doing that, for going, I deserve to order a pizza and have it delivered. It, it was fine. The world didn't end and I had leftovers. Pick a theme for gifts that you give that year. You know what? No one's going to complain if you give them an Amazon gift card, for example. But you can make it super easy. And just using Amazon gift cards as an example, no, I don't work for them. They come in a variety of designs and dollar amounts and can be emailed right to the recipient so you don't have to worry about them being stolen. You don't have to worry about the card being phony. You can just, boom, send them right off. Make a list of easy recipes and rotate through them. I cook a lot, so if you don't have easy recipes, when we get to the end, note my email address, send me a note and I'll send you a whole bunch. Make double the amount of a recipe and freeze half because in addition to finding Stouffer's in my freezer, it's super nice when I open my freezer and discover I froze soup a month ago. That makes me very happy. So I'm going to encourage you to say yes to certain things. Start saying yes when people ask if there's anything you can do to help you. But to do this, you first have to come up with a list of things people can help with. So I'm sure you're wondering why in the world I wrote bananas or other food that quickly expires. So a couple years back, one of my neighbors and I were talking one day and she was like, oh, I went to the grocery store to get bananas. And the other one said, oh, wait, I just went to the grocery store. I could have gotten your bananas. So this neighbor and I now will text each other and say, if one of us is going to the grocery store, we'll say, hey, I'm going to the grocery store. Do you need bananas or something else? 
So we just, our, our currency of exchange is bananas. We don't pay each other for them. And the other day I even gave her something more expensive to buy and I did pay her for that. But it is so nice if you have something that it's like, I really don't have an interest in going to the store two or three times a week just to have non-mushy bananas in my house. And I don't, my husband doesn't really want half the week without bananas. So my neighbor and I help each other out and it's fantastic. We do the same thing with library books. And you can, if you have a neighbor who you know goes to the library on a regular basis or you go on a regular basis, make friends with that neighbor and say, hey, I'm going to the library. Can I take something? Are you going? Can you please return this book for me? It works great. We even, um, with my neighbor and I, we even will pick up holds that each other has. You can make on your list, you can write that somebody can help pay for something. Now you're probably thinking, what? Okay, how about if they help pay for your gardener? You know, maybe for a gift, they could pay for your gardener one month. Or they can help pay for your groceries. They can do an Instacart order for you. Now, this is a big one, flying into town to stay with a loved one. But here's the thing. Sometimes we don't tell people what we need and we don't even know it ourselves. I had an opportunity to attend a conference last fall except it meant I had to be away from home just for a couple of days. And this was after my husband was sick. Oh, by the way, it turned out to be shingles. Even though we were both vaccinated, we both ended up with it. His was put him into like 20 hours of sleep and mine just made my skin itchy. Anyway, so after my husband had the shingles um, outbreak, I had was given an opportunity to attend a conference and realized I couldn't leave him at home at all. And I was on the verge of canceling it. And I was texting with my brother who lives in Arizona and said, oh, I've got to turn down a conference. And he's like, oh, well, you should have asked me first. What are you talking about? I didn't know about this. He's right. I never told him about it. Do you want to know why? Because I felt selfish and guilty about even going to it. And it, I was going to be gone Thursday to Sunday. And my brother said, I work from home on Thursday and Friday. It doesn't matter if I work at my home or yours. I can fly in Wednesday night and fly out Monday morning and not take any time off and be fine. So that's what we did. We paid for his airfare and he came in and stayed with my husband for the weekend and it was perfect. Sometimes you need somebody to listen, not to, not to talk, not to give you feedback you don't want, but to just listen. And sometimes we need someone to sit with our loved one but sometimes we'd like somebody to take our loved one out, maybe to the park, maybe for a cup of coffee. So you can work self-care into routine things. Now that one probably sounds really weird, but for example, you can take a slow shower. What does that mean? I take fast showers. Seriously, when I get in the shower in the morning, I wash my body, my face, my hair, rinse everything off, and I'm out. I mean, seriously, it might be five minutes. I don't have time for anything else in the morning. But one day I didn't take a shower until after lunch. I pulled out the body scrub, the nice lotion, the sample face mask, and I used all those things I don't normally have time to do. And it was really nice. How about using the body lotion, the shower gel, and the bubble bath that you bought? probably from Bath and Body Works, because I think we all have that, as a just-in-case gift. You deserve that gift. Fix something you like to eat. Now, there's a story on the internet called Make the Chili that I won't go through. You can look that one up. But basically, it's about going out of your way for someone. It's about going out of your way for you. Fix something you like to eat. It might not be what your loved one can eat, but you deserve to eat food you like, too. Pick the flowers from your yard for yourself. Bring them in and enjoy them. And use the good china, crystal, and silver. Stop saving things for good. I, you know, use them now, and if it breaks, at least you used it. It's better than losing, in my case, the items in an earthquake, and for others, in another natural disaster, or, you know, because who wants to die with a full set of Tiffany glasses? Use them. Don't be like my grandmother. When she died, we found nightgowns and sweaters in her drawer that still had tags on them. Now, that might be because we gave her too many of those things. But you're going to have them take, if you're going to have them taking up room in your drawers, use them. If they aren't right for you and you can't return them, pass them on to someone who will get joy out of them. Make friends with your library. Now, I know before I talked about making friends with someone who goes to the library, but get to know what your library offers. Audiobooks board games you can borrow, DVDs, actual books, 
actual magazines. And some libraries have activities, like our library has an adult craft club. And you know what? If you want to go, you meet people. It's free. You don't have to think of the craft, buy the supplies, clean it up. You just show up, do your thing, and leave with a little funky craft. You can also borrow DVDs and things like that through services like Libby or Hoopla that a lot of libraries have. Those also allow you to download movies and audiobooks or even ebooks. And if you have your library has access to Hoopla and you can get to it, you can even borrow a seven day Hallmark Movies Now binge pass. Kind of cool, huh? Stay in the present. This is definitely self care. I don't know about you, but for me, staying in the present is way easier said than done. We hear it all the time, but sometimes my mind just jumps to the future. My son, I only have the one, was home at Christmas, and about halfway through his visit, I found myself thinking, he's only here for a few more days, and I started to feel sad. I kept bringing my thoughts back to the present so I could enjoy my time with him, rather than wasting my time with my son, thinking about when he wouldn't be here. Ah, he's in New Jersey. That's what you need to know for that. But as caregivers, we can do the same thing. Things are okay today with our loved one, but we think, what about when they're not? What's tomorrow gonna bring? What are we about five years? When I, my husband was first diagnosed, I remember, I still distinctly remember standing in the shower and crying and wondering about how I was going to afford a care home for my husband and still pay for college for our son. Needless to say, neither of those things became an issue. But we worry about what will the future bring? How will we handle it? There's often actions that we need to take in advance of something like we all need to prepare our wills, but we don't need to spend our entire life thinking about why we are preparing our will. Medical tests, ours and our loved one, I don't know, they can be a huge source of stress. Trying to get it scheduled, waiting for it to be done, and to me the worst, waiting for the results. Think about what you can do during those times to make it a little easier. Can you ask someone to go with you when you have the test done? Can you ask someone to help you take your mind off anticipating the test results? My neighbor and I both have what I call a creative mind where we invent things to worry about. Not will the neighbor's chimney fall down, but oh my gosh, when I get this test, what if it says this? What if the results are that? What if, what if, what if, what if? So it's nice to talk to her and realize she does the same thing. And then we discuss how silly we are and we help each other talk out our concerns or worries. I mean, I have other friends who don't do that, so they don't get what I do. <clears throat> but in my family, right now, we're facing our son's deployment to Kuwait at the end of March. So staying in the present is not only a self-care goal, but believe me, it's a necessity for me right now. And that's not exactly a goal I can establish using the SMART approach. Or can I? Let's see if there's some tools I can use. You can plan ahead. I'm not talking about what ifing, but I'm talking about planning ahead for times when your mind goes into overdrive. You can create a list of what you can do when you're overthinking, worrying, or otherwise feeling out of control. Because when your mind is going cuckoo, you need ways to occupy it. By the way, mind going cuckoo, technical term. So here's a list for me. I like comfort TV, which I'll explain. I like solitaire with cards or on the computer. And in fact, during 2020, when my mind would go into negative places, I would just like watch TV and shuffle cards. I know that sounds funny, but somehow the repetitive motion of shuffling the cards helped me relax. Um, listening to favorite music. For me, it's something I can sing along with loudly. Um, engage in something that takes your full attention, like baking or a craft. Hmm. One day I wasn't giving baking my full attention. It was making cookies. And I always put down parchment paper on my cookie sheet so I don't have to watch it, wash it. And I smelled something funny while they were baking. Do you know if you use wax paper instead of parchment paper, the wax melts and you have to throw out the cookies. <clears throat> Thank goodness I only did that on those cookie sheets. Phone a friend. Now, sometimes you need someone who's a good listener who will just listen to everything you say and reassure you and not jump in and tell you what's wrong with their life because they have a hangnail. And sometimes you just need that good talker so you don't have to think and they're just going to chatter on and on and on. And after 45 minutes, they might come up for air, but they're the kind of people that you can call them, put the phone on speaker, walk out of the room and they're still talking. But sometimes that's helpful. You can exercise, go for a walk, use an exercise DVD or a streaming service or put on music and just dance. Cleaning, you can clean. Like for me, I can't really vacuum if I'm upset because 
I can't listen to a podcast or music and I do need something to occupy my mind, but I can scrub the floors or clean the toilet or oil the kitchen cabinets and gardening. I find pulling weeds very um, fulfilling because I can see the results instantly. So what comforts you? We all know what comfort food is. Maybe it's macaroni and cheese, chicken noodle soup. We all have ideas of comfort food. Comfort music, I would describe as that music that we enjoy listening to. It, it touches our soul or it makes us happy or it makes us think of loved ones. And then there's comfort TV and you might not have a clue what I mean, but my mom and I enjoyed watching Murder, She Wrote. And later my son and I watched it together. So I like watching it now because it makes me think of my mom and my son. It comforts me, hence comfort TV, when I'm sad or lonely, and it can take my mind off of things when I'm freaking out. That's self-care. But we talked about saying yes, but what about saying no? There's a, I'm giving you permission to say no to a lot of things. Events you don't want to attend. Seriously, we all know we have those we're invited to and you're like, I really don't want to do that. In fact, I was talking to my husband today and about this particular person. I don't really enjoy going to things with her. And I finally said, OK, I'm giving a talk on self-care today. I need to start saying no to these. That would be self-care. Say no to things that don't fit you, whether it's clothing, like you bought that blouse and it's itchy and it, you don't like it. And you, oh, every time you see it in your closet, you remember you spent money on it out or your schedule because it's too full, or things that don't work for you. Maybe you're in a book club that no longer fits, or that support group's not quite right for you. Find another one. Say no to providers who don't listen or meet your needs, people who aren't supportive. Finishing books you don't like. There's millions of books out there. You don't have to finish every one you, st you start. And exchanging gifts if that no longer works for you. Yes, we talked about having one standard gift for the whole year, but it's also okay to say, hey, let's not exchange gifts. Let's have a long phone call or let's go out for a cup of coffee. Don't be afraid to call 911 for you or your loved one. Don't discuss it or negotiate it, just make the call. Last year, I heard two different stories from people in the class I teach where in both cases, the men walked in the room and found their wife lying on the floor. She didn't know why, how she got there. One was in a puddle of blood and they both said, do you want me to call 911? Of course they said no, people are embarrassed. It just happened with my neighbor a couple of weeks ago. Just stop negotiating and stop trying to talk yourself out of needing help. Do, you know, you might be thinking, is this really a heart attack? You're not the doctor, just make the darn call. It's gonna be okay. They're not gonna punish you because you were having an anxiety attack or because you had bad indigestion and not a heart attack. It's really okay, take care of yourself. And know who to call to help you in an emergency. I don't mean 911. I mean, who else could you call? What friend or neighbor would bring you soup when you're sick or help you get in touch with your loved ones, your other loved ones, your extended family in a true emergency? Give your emergency contact, that person we just mentioned, a list of the names and numbers of people you need called in an emergency. Because if you're a caregiver, one of the things you're gonna need is someone to step in and help your loved one. And how you need to have think about that in advance. Who is it going to be? Is it going to be the neighbor that you're going to, they're going to just take over your loved one and make these calls for you? Fantastic. But have one primary person who knows who to call and make sure other people know who your contact point is. Say, hey, Susan is my contact point. Rachel, you need to know this so that if anything ever happens to me, you can go to Susan. So yes, that's my case. One of my neighbors has the names and numbers of the people who would need to be contacted of an in an emergency. They also have her contact information. Otherwise, they're going to wonder what the heck she's contacting them about. Don't feel guilty about those self-care habits that don't work for you. OK, so journaling, meditating, mindfulness and gratitude lists, which I even heard mentioned today on a podcast. Those are all wonderful self-care habits. I mean, we they're great and they're so important. And I don't like any of them. Not one of those do I like. And I've tried them all. So, you know, I mean, I have gratitude journals that have three pages used in it and journals I waste money on. And it, it just, it's okay to move on to the next thing and say, that didn't work. Let me find something that does. Deal with things that irritate you. My spice cabinet was um, a skinny cupboard shelf. And I had to take all the spices out every single time. They were double stacked to find what I'd want. Finally, after 20 years in our home, 20 years, 
I bought some little things that could stick inside another cabinet and these spice jars could all fit right into it. I still have some in the spice cabinet, but so many less that it no longer irritates me because I can see what's in it. Make brain dump lists of things you want to remember or when you're feeling overwhelmed by everything you need to do. There are days where I think I have so many things I need to do that I just list even the small things. I need to feed the cat. I need to take out the trash. I need to empty the dishwasher. Even those routine things because I like to cross things off my list. But what are some useful lists you could make? You could make a list of ways people can help you. You want to be prepared when they actually say, what can I do? Because so often they say, I want to help. What can I do? And it's like, um, I don't know. Have, be ready. Be ready with that list. Make a list of things you'd like but don't want to buy for yourself because people will say, oh, I want to give you a gift. What would you like? Do you want a Christmas gift, a birthday gift? I'm going to give you something. And I don't know about you, but I thought about something six months ago. And now I don't remember what it was. So just write it down. You know, like it might be a gift, might be a gift card. Have a standing grocery list. I have one that I made on the computer and I just check off what I need. I don't really have to think about it. I might look at it and say, oh yeah, bananas. There they go again, bread. And then on the back side, I write a menu plan for the week. Sometimes it doesn't have much on it, but I at least write one. Some of the ways people could help you on that first one, they could run errands, bring you a meal, visit you or your loved one, stay with your loved one while you go out for coffee with someone or by yourself. They could do household chores. Or what about those handyman type jobs? You know, you have a, a faucet that needs tightening and you just can't do it. There are people out there who can do it. Or you like right now, you might have Christmas decorations that you need to put back up in the attic or a crawl space and it's really hard for you to do, but there might be someone who can help you do it. So this next one I thought was kind of fun. You can travel without leaving home. If you're interested in traveling, not everyone is, you don't have to limit yourself to things you can do only in person. Um, ricksteves.com. You can go to that website. You'll see, scroll down, you'll see Monday Night Travel and you can click and they click on that and they will have upcoming live events, but they'll also have videos going back to 2020 and you can go all over Europe and you don't even need a passport. If you Google California's gold, you're gonna be taken to an archive of a few hundred California road trip type videos. I'm letting you know they're on the Chapman University website. So when that Google search takes you there, you won't wonder why. You can Google, like a zoo cam or an owl cam. I used to love to watch the um, baby pandas when they had them at the Smithsonian. It's so fun and I don't have to be there to see it. And frankly, I'm getting a better view than if I was. And you can also Google words like video and a place's name to see if there's a video. Like I Googled video and Smithsonian and found some really interesting things that would be more detailed than if I was visiting the Smithsonian. And no, I know it's not the same as being there, but you don't have to pack, pay for a trip, or stand in line for the bathroom. Connecting with others. Thank goodness for Zoom and FaceTime. I know, again, not the same as being there, but think about 20 years ago before they had those. My parents were in Arizona. I only saw them when it was in person. So Zoom or FaceTime, that would have been really fun. And it's I stay in touch with my son in New Jersey through FaceTime once a week. We talk other times, but FaceTime once a week is lovely. Phone calls, yes, we can all still make phone calls. Text messages, okay, maybe we get too many, but just like you can send a quick little note and they're probably gonna reply back to you or send a smiley face or send a one of those with the head exploding if you're having that kind of day and they'll get the message. We can stay in touch via email and snail mail. And that might be something you tell somebody you need help with is, hey, send me a card, send me a funny card, send me something that makes me smile or laugh. Here's the thing, it's okay to take time for yourself. We give so much of ourselves to others and we need to be fueled both physically and mentally. If we are in balance, it helps us in all our interactions. And this is Faith Hill giving you permission to engage in self-care. So my suggestion is you try one, just one self-care item each month. If it works, keep it. If it doesn't, try something else. I've given you a lot of options, a lot of ideas to get you started thinking. And, you know, coming to something like this is wonderful because it shows you're interested. So now I thought you'd enjoy this as our program ends. 
This is one of the pictures I took at the beach on December 30th of our waves. They don't look that big, but they were. And the thing was, they just kept coming one after another, which is pretty unusual. This year, I plan to add pictures from a dozen more beach visits. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Your time is valuable, and I hope you found a few ideas you can implement to help you take care of yourself. 